time to press forward with my series on the last day of the last days. Uh, this is, I don't actually know the sermon count. This might be sermon seven. If not, uh, forgive me for getting the numbers wrong. But we're going to press on with this. Uh, of course, most recently, I've been kind of doing a set on the millennium in particular and trying to address you know, what that passage in Revelation 20 might be talking about when talking about the, uh, the thousand years that's described there. And I've made the argument uh, that what is commonly known as you know, the millennium is actually just you know, this present age, the age of the church you know, between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Uh, that is the point of view known as amillennialism, which just means that there's no literal millennium or no future millennium, but the millennium is now. Uh, now, if that is correct, then we can expect the present age to continue largely as it is until the day of Christ's return, uh, at which time we will see the general resurrection, the final judgment, the new heavens and the new earth, and the consummation of the kingdom of God, uh, pretty much all at one time. So really under amillennialism, all the events that we are expecting to happen, happen basically at the same time at the end of the millennium when Christ returns. Now, despite my confidence in the argument that I have made so far, I have not yet addressed the chief argument made by many Christians against that amillennial understanding. You know, I've dealt with the millennium passage directly and some other passages that kind of come in to help us uh, figure out what's going on there. But I've not addressed the one main light argument that really drives what might be called the opposition to that view. And for that reason, I need to pivot to another topic, uh, another topic of controversy among Christians, and that is how to interpret Old Testament prophecy. And of course, that's the big topic for this sermon, how to interpret Old Testament prophecy. So today, what I want to do is I want to argue that Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled by the heavenly kingdom of Christ and not by an earthly kingdom for Israel. That is the main point of everything I'm trying to say today about interpreting Old Testament prophecy. Now, when I speak of the contrast between an earthly kingdom and a heavenly kingdom, I mean what Jesus was trying to convey to Pontius Pilate uh, during one of his uh, phases of his trial before Pilate. And I just want to read from John chapter 18, verses 36 through 37, to show you what I mean. So Jesus answered Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So when I speak of a heavenly kingdom, I mean a kingdom which subverts the expectations that most people have about authority, power, and glory. I'm not talking about a heavenly kingdom in the sense of, you know, floating around the clouds. I'm not talking about a heavenly kingdom in terms of, you know, strictly spiritual realities, although those certainly play a part. I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about a kingdom that subverts earthly expectations for what a kingdom is like. An earthly kingdom is governed by prestige, empowered by wealth, and glorified by its control over others. Like those are the things that make up a kingdom that we might consider to be great. Uh, that's how the world thinks of a kingdom in its greatness. A heavenly kingdom is governed by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the gospel of Christ, and glorified by the grace and mercy of God within it. Uh, that is the contrast between an earthly kingdom and a heavenly kingdom. In that sense, I want to argue that Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled by the heavenly kingdom of Christ and not by an earthly kingdom for Israel. That we need to uh, finally just, just discharge all these ideas about a great earthly kingdom 
uh, when thinking of the, the heavenly kingdom that Jesus brought. And that goes double for how we read prophecy and how we understand all of that in the context of the end times. So my sermon today is called The Problem of Prophecy, because that is what we're dealing with, the problem of how we interpret Old Testament prophecy. My outline has five headings, as I often do. I'll tell you what those are uh, so you can follow along a little more easily as I go through these points. First, uh, some Christians believe that Old Testament prophecy points to Jewish hopes of a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom. And I just want to talk about that, that, that's, that point of view does exist, and a little bit as to why it exists. Secondly, the Old Testament undermines these hopes by telling us that prophecy is not what it seems to be. When you look at, at prophets talking about prophecy, you figure out that you can't read this stuff the way you think you should. Uh, there is a different way of reading it that is very much necessary, and they imply this. Third, the New Testament encourages us to understand Old Testament prophecy through the mystery of the gospel. And when I say that, the mystery of the gospel, I'm not talking about some woo-woo stuff. I mean, this is an actual biblical expression, mystery of the gospel. It has a very specific meaning, and it applies to this topic we're, we're discussing today. Fourth, we should interpret Old Testament prophecy according to the example of New Testament authors. So in that heading, I want to actually show you some ways that the New Testament authors interpret Old Testament prophecy and glean what we can from their example. And then finally, based on these considerations, I just want to argue at the very end, a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom has no place in the end times. You know, despite the prominence that that idea does have among some Christians for the end times, that is just not where we should be going with our thoughts in terms of what's going to happen before Jesus returns, or at the time of his return, or however you want to say that. Now, I suppose many would consider this to be a dense message, and I suppose it kind of is. There's a lot of scripture quotations coming, and a lot of splitting of hairs, uh, so all of that is very much coming in this sermon. That said, it is also a sermon that can unlock large portions of the Bible for your understanding and your encouragement. Probably about half the Bible in some way is composed of prophecy, of Old Testament prophecy. How do you read that part of your Bible? Well, this sermon does answer that question. And so with that goal in mind, let's begin. Let's get on to the first of those headings, very much the, the introductory one. So first up, I need to address how some Christians believe that Old Testament prophecy points to Jewish hopes of a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom. Uh, so this is talking about what quite a few Christians believe in some measure. I think some of them may be not even realizing that that is what they believe, uh, but nonetheless it is out there and we need to talk about it. Let's begin with an example of Old Testament prophecy. Let's actually just give an extended passage here of what we are discussing as we talk about Old Testament prophecy. So I'm just going to read Isaiah chapter 60, the whole chapter. Kind of a long one, but it's very representative of the kinds of things that the Old Testament prophets would say and the kinds of things that Christians bring into these conversations about the end times. So here we go. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in their arms. Then you will see and be radiant. Your heart will thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, the wealth of the nations will come to you. A multitude of camels will cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba will come. Now they will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar, and I shall glorify my glorious house. Who are these who fly like a cloud and like doves to their lattices? Surely the coastlands will wait for me, 
and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them, for the name of the Lord your God, and for the Holy One of Israel, because he has glorified you. Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring to you the wealth of the nations, with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish, and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and all those who despised you will bow themselves at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. You will also suck the milk of nations and suck the breast of kings. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron, I will make peace your administrators and righteousness your overseers. Violence will not be heard again in your land, nor devastation or destruction within your borders. But you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor brightness will the moon give you light, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane. For you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous, and will possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. The smallest one, <clears throat> the smallest one will become a clan, and the least one a mighty nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it, and it's time. A casual reading of that passage certainly creates the impression of the world's most powerful, most effective, and most glorious empire, ruling over all the nations, receiving their wealth, and being secure from any threat. Certainly, all of that is in there, in terms of just a straightforward reading of Isaiah chapter 60. This is the kind of kingdom that many Jews were hoping to have at the time Jesus came. This was the active hope. This is what they thought the Messiah would bring. Since Jesus presented himself rather differently than any earthly king, they were not pleased with Jesus and ultimately killed him. You know, from their point of view, Jesus did not and would not fulfill the prophecies of their scriptures and therefore could not be the Messiah. Nonetheless, <clears throat> Despite that discrepancy there, and despite the fact that there were people that still believed in Jesus from among the Jews, uh, despite all of that, you might think they would take that as a sign that maybe they needed to rethink things. But even the first Jewish Christians didn't really rethink any of this. A lot of them still had hopes for that supremely successful Jewish kingdom. And we see the, the most uh, famous statement of this is right when Jesus is about to ascend to heaven. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 6. The disciples say to him at the time, they say to him something like this. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So still among them, you know, there was this idea that there's a kingdom for Israel coming, and are you going to do that now? Now even today, many Christians read those prophecies, like in Isaiah 60, or throughout the Old Testament, in a very similar fashion to the ancient Jews and the misguided disciples there at the beginning, thinking that there's this kingdom coming for Israel. The greatest theological consequence of these beliefs regarding the Old Testament prophecy is for the end times. Even though it seems like a separate topic, and you can talk about it separately, it very much ties into everything we're discussing with regard to the last day of the last days. Uh, such Christians who hold those kinds of beliefs have observed 
that Israel has never, at any time in history, possessed the unbroken peace, prosperity, and dominance which they find in Old Testament prophecy. The stuff that you read about of this, like this glorious supreme Jewish kingdom has never existed at all at any time. Therefore, any supremely powerful Jewish kingdom must be a yet future reality. This must be something coming uh, down the line as part of end time stuff as we await the return of Christ. In trying to find a span of time for when this Jewish kingdom could exist, such Christians can find only one period of time that might work, and that is the millennium. You know, this thousand year period mentioned by John in Revelation chapter 20. They think, well, maybe that's when this will happen. And as a rule, if you believe that Old Testament prophecy portrays a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom, uh, then you also believe in premillennialism, uh, which is the belief that the millennium is a yet future period of time, 1,000 years long, uh, beginning with the full return of Christ and ending with the new heavens and the new earth. It's called premillennialism because the return of Christ happens before the millennium, premillennial. Now, on the one hand, not every premillennialist uh, believes in that you know, coming Jewish kingdom. But I would say that every Christian who does believe in that coming Jewish kingdom is a premillennialist. That's how the, the logic of that works. That's how the Venn diagram, I guess you could say, works for these kinds of things. And if you interpret the Old Testament like I've been describing, you will be a premillennialist. There's pretty much, I don't know of anyone that has... Uh, broken that rule, so to speak. It seems like this kind of interpretation of prophecy leads to premillennialism. Now, since this is a matter so influential for how Christians understand the end times, I need to address this belief that the Old Testament somehow portrays this coming Jewish kingdom that is basically the world's greatest empire ever. I need to address that uh, because there are a lot of people who on the strength of that point of view of Old Testament prophecy therefore are premillennialists. So I have to talk about this. Which I'll start doing here and now as we get into our second heading. In my second heading for today, I want to argue that the Old Testament undermines these hope of a Jewish kingdom by telling us that prophecy is not what it seems to be. And that is a very very operable phrase uh, here for this sermon. Prophecy is not what it seems to be. So what I want to do is I want to show you three principles derived from three passages uh, from the Old Testament regarding prophecy. I could quote a lot more passages. The more you read with your eyes open as you go through the Old Testament and you see prophets commenting on prophecy, the more you see that this actually is how they view it, even the men who are writing these things. And you just need to put it together and realize that there's something going on here that needs to be on your mind as you interpret these things. So let's start with the first of these principles. First, prophecy is usually meant to be unclear, which is probably very counterintuitive to you. But prophecy is usually meant to be unclear. Now the passage I want to read for this is from Numbers chapter 12. And this is the event where we see, um, this is during the Exodus, this is where you see Aaron and Miriam leading a very short-lived rebellion against Moses. And we see God show up to deal with that. So this is Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 5. It says this, Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent. And he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against, Mo <coughs> against Moses? That is a fascinating passage on a few different levels, but today, just to point out here, 
Moses is an exception to the rule when it comes to prophets. The way he operates is not the same as the rest of them. To Moses, God speaks openly and fully. As an example, the law of Moses is a very direct kind of revelation. Do this, don't do that. I mean, yeah, there's reasons to uh, maybe argue over interpretation, but they're all pretty grounded in the realization this is a legal code and you have to interpret it accordingly. By contrast, according to this passage, most prophets receive revelations in dreams and visions, not openly, and the revelations are in the form of dark sayings, or riddles, as some Bible translations will translate this expression. So you have this kind of obscured, riddlesome, not open uh, way of delivering revelation that God does to these prophets. Therefore, when you approach prophecy, you should know that you are at best getting something not clear in the way that the law of Moses is clear, but something dark and riddlesome. You need to enter into prophecy with that mindset. You're about to read a bunch of riddles, and you need to get that in your mind as you read them. Second principle and second passage. God uses prophecy to conceal truth, not reveal it. And again, this is kind of, it's kind of the logical consequence of what I just said, but God has done this deliberately to conceal truth in prophecy. Now, this second passage comes from Isaiah again. This time it's Isaiah chapter 6, and this is the call of Isaiah toward the beginning of his ministry. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until cities are devastated and without inhabitant, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. Which means Isaiah's whole ministry was meant to fail as a warning. It was meant to fail in that regard. The goal of Isaiah's prophetic ministry was not to reveal truth, but actually to conceal it. People would see, but not see. They would hear, but not hear. Isaiah's job was to render the hearts of this people insensitive, to use their expression. It was meant to turn off the lights and silence his own ministry in a lot of ways. That was the point of his prophetic ministry. Before you look at prophecies from Isaiah or any other prophet, you have to bear in mind uh, that they are not always meant to reveal truth, they're very often meant to conceal it from people, uh, just as was happening in, the Isaiah, in Isaiah's ministry. So there is that. Now finally, there's one more principle and one more passage here, and that, that is prophecy would be concealed until the time of the end. Like this state, you know, it wasn't like just Isaiah's thing, uh, not by any means. This is a state of affairs that would endure to the end, the whole concealing of truth within prophecy. Now for this, let's look at the end of Daniel's book. And I find this especially significant to be going to Daniel's book for this. Daniel's book is considered by many to be the most detailed and the most helpful book for predicting the future. I mean, people that love to, you know, guess the date of Jesus' return and lay out their charts and, charts and timelines for what all is going to happen in the end times, they love the book of Daniel. They completely disregard the very end of the book of Daniel when they do that. Let's read what he says at the very end. This is going to be Daniel chapter 12, verses 8 through 9. As for me, I heard, but could not understand. So I said, my Lord, this is the angel who's revealing these things to him, my Lord, what will be the outcome of these events? He said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up until the end of time. 
So first and foremost, Daniel plainly states that he does not understand his own visions and has to ask about their outcome, and then is told nothing. Like Daniel is left there not understanding his own book uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so there is that. You know, that's very much a point in favor of prophecy concealing truth rather than revealing it. Even the prophet doesn't understand what he's talking about. The angel speaking to him also says that his words are going to be concealed until the end time. They're going to be covered up. They're going to be hidden. That should remind you of what God told Isaiah about concealing the truth in prophecy. It should also imply that God is withholding the key to prophecy until the end time so that we could not unlock it ahead of that time. This is very much stuff that is under lock and key. Even though it's here in a book where you can read it, it's under lock and key. It's concealed. Now, I could read more passages, but these three suffice to make my point. Old Testament prophecy is meant to be unclear, meant to conceal truth, and meant to stay that way until the end time. This is not something where you can just read it. Um, it's not just this kind of, it's not like reading stereo instructions or anything like that. It's not meant to be that at all. It's meant to be this dark, riddlesome thing, and it's meant to stay that way until the end time so that you don't really get it. Therefore, I say that Old Testament prophecy is not what it seems. You can go in there and read it and be like, oh yeah, I understand what's going to happen. No, you don't. You only think you do. You only think you do. You fall into the same trap that Isaiah laid for Israel throughout his whole ministry. You only think you understand it. If you do assume that you understand these things, you're actually just as wrong as the generation that rejected Jesus. Don't forget, they rejected him because he wasn't doing the kind of stuff they expected the Messiah to do. Everything in their prophets told them that, hey, there's going to be this conquering king. We're going to be the number one nation on the planet. Jesus is all about love and healing. He's not the Messiah. Let's kill him. Like, if you have the same way of reading prophecy as they did, that you're waiting for this great Jewish kingdom, you're making the same mistake that they did back then. You've got to get your head out of that and realize that when you look at the clues that I've just given you in these three passages and these three principles, prophecy is not what it seems. You think it's saying this, it's not saying that. There's something else. As for what that something else is, that brings us into the next point. If everything I have said is true, we have to ask a question, and that is, what hope do we have in understanding Old Testament prophecy? I mean, is this whole chunk of our Bible just worthless to us because it's under lock and key? I mean, what hope do we have? What do we do? How do we interact with this? Well, I intend to answer that question now in my third heading for today. The New Testament encourages us to understand Old Testament prophecy through the mystery of the gospel, okay? Uh, so through the mystery of the gospel, we can begin to make headway in understanding what's going on here. All right, so the mystery of the gospel. Now, I mentioned earlier, I'm going to come back to this, I mentioned earlier that Old Testament prophecy is something like a riddle, okay? A dark saying, or a riddle, as some people translate it. So let's try a riddle. Let's see how good you are at riddles. Here's a thought experiment for you. Here's a riddle for you. Um, what can you hold? Let's see here. What can you hold? Uh, right here. Let's see here. I wrote it down so I could actually say this. Okay. What can you hold in your left hand, but not in your right hand? There you go. What can you hold in your left hand that you can't hold in your right hand? So what's the answer to that? Well, the answer is actually your right elbow. Okay? You can hold your right elbow in your left hand, but you can't hold it with your right hand. You just can't do that. Now that I tell you the answer there, when I tell you the answer to the riddle, you probably have some measure of regret that you couldn't figure that out. It's like, oh yeah, and you do that whole face palm thing. That's usually how it works with riddles. You feel like you should know the answer, but you don't. And when you get the answer, you think you're stupid because you couldn't figure it out, because it was right there in front of you. The answer was right there, in the riddle itself very often. Riddles are like that. They're meant to be confusing. They're meant to throw you off from the right answer, even as they're really laying out for you what you should be thinking as you're, as you're hearing the riddle. Prophecy is like a riddle. Once you know the answer, you can go back to the prophecy and figure out how it made sense. 
It's the kind of thing where God has to tell you the answer to the riddle before you can figure it out, and God has to tell you what the fulfillment of prophecy is before you can go back and see how that works. That's very much how Old Testament prophecy interacts with the mystery of the gospel. Now, according to the New Testament, the good news about Jesus, that is the gospel, is the answer to the riddle of prophecy. And once you know the gospel, you can go back to the Old Testament and make sense of prof prophecy. Um, I, I have emphasized from the very beginning that when Jesus came, you know, that was the beginning of the last days. So it's, we are now living in the time of the end and have been for 2,000 years now, which means maybe, according to the end of the book of Daniel, maybe we can start unlocking some of these things. And according to the New Testament, you begin to unlock them through the gospel, specifically through the mystery of the gospel. Now, I want to read the classic statement of that idea, the mystery of the gospel. The classic statement of this idea, or at least one of them, is from one of Paul's letters. This is the letter to the Romans at the very end of the book, so you can turn to Romans 16 if you want to see this. This comes at the very end of the letter. Paul is saying his farewells, but he sneaks in some very weighty ideas here at the end. So Romans 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. There are two things implied by what Paul writes there. And the difficult part of this is, those two things seem to be at odds with each other, but Paul puts them together. On the one hand, Paul says that the gospel has been made known by the scriptures of the prophets. You can go to the scriptures of the prophets and see the gospel there, okay? So read the prophets and you'll find the gospel there. Okay, yeah, fine. However, Paul has also written there that the gospel was a mystery which has been kept secret for ages past, that the gospel itself was like not known through all these centuries and millennia. So apparently no one could have known what Jesus would do when he arrived. And historically speaking, that was true. Jesus confused everybody by the things he said and did. No one saw that coming. But how can both of those things be true? That the gospel is in the prophets, but was also kept a mystery from ages past. I mean, it seems like it should be either one or the other. Like, you know, if the gospel is a mystery, then it wouldn't be anywhere in the prophets. But if the gospel's in the prophets, then it's not a mystery kept secret for long ages. How does this work? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We've been talking about it all this time. The Old Testament prophets did write about the gospel, but in such a way that their meaning could not be known until Jesus actually came revealing the secret. The gospel is in the prophets, but it's more like encoded in the prophets. It's wrapped up in the riddles that compose prophecy so that you can't actually get to it until Jesus comes to start doing things, and then you can go back and be like, ah, okay, yeah, I see the connection between what Jesus is doing and what these prophets are saying, if you're willing to look. As Jesus would say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's how this works. Old Testament prophecy is like a riddle, and the gospel is the answer that explains the riddle, so that you can go back and see how it makes sense. Now, this will determine how we read the Old Testament prophets. This is, again, the key for unlocking that whole part of your Bible. We cannot, again, we cannot make the mistake of reading the prophets in the same way that people read them before Jesus came. If we do that, we're going to be just as wrong as they were in thinking about the kingdom of God, in thinking about the end times, Israel's role in all of this, whatever. We're going to be wrong in all of that. Instead, we have to read the prophets from the perspective of the gospel. We have to read them as a revelation of the gospel that was kept secret, but now can be made known now that we can look back on it with the advantages of hindsight based on the ministry of Jesus. 
And my assertion to you is, if we read the prophets from the perspective of the gospel, we will see that Old Testament prophecy is fulfilled by the heavenly kingdom of Christ and not by an earthly kingdom for Israel. When you really start to dig down into this and start trying to do it, you start trying to live these things out in your study of the Bible, you get further and further away from this earthly kingdom for Israel, and you see more and more of what this heavenly kingdom will be that subverts all the world's expectations for how a kingdom works. So let's get into that. And you're probably asking right now for some kind of guidance. You know, it's like, how do we do this? How do we go through the Old Testament and change our way of reading these prophecies and, and decoding the riddles? How do we actually go about doing that? So in my fourth heading for today, I'll provide some advice for interpreting the Old Testament prophecy according to the example of New Testament authors, which I consider to be very important. We want to be biblical about this. That certainly implies that we should do these things the way that is demonstrated for us in scripture. So let's try to do that. Now I have three pieces of advice for you from three different passages. So I wanna go through those in order and just show you how I think this should work. The first piece of advice is consider non-literal fulfillments. Now, literal just means uh, interpreting words and phrases in their most basic sense. Uh, the, when you look up the meaning of a word in a dictionary, you're looking at the literal meaning of the word. Uh, and there are a lot of Christians who pride themselves and who insist on interpreting Old Testament prophecy literally. It's like the thing they think they need to do. Uh, I'm suggesting to you not to be too concerned about that because I don't think New Testament authors were that concerned about that. Now, uh, my example for this comes from the debate in Acts chapter 15 about how to handle Gentiles who are turning to Christ. And, you know, this is a big debate over, you know, do we circumcise them first? Uh, do they have to become Jews before they can become Christians? Really strange to us, but that was a big deal for them. Now, I want to quote uh, how James talks about this, because James talks about it by quoting the prophet Amos. And I want us to see how he applies that prophecy from Amos. So let's have a look at that in Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 13. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After these things I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Says the Lord who makes these things, who makes these things known from long ago. Now, if the words of Amos's prophecy were meant to point to a literal fulfillment, we would expect the building of some kind of structure that would be called the Tabernacle of David. You know, the Tabernacle was that big tent that they had in the wilderness during the Exodus. Or we would, we would expect something like that. Maybe, maybe the successor to the Tabernacle, like a temple. Maybe it refers to the entire city of Jerusalem. You, know, you could certainly call that whole city the Tabernacle of David in some sense. The literal meaning of that prophecy would refer to the building of some physical structure called the Tabernacle of David. But that's not how James applies the prophecy. He applies it to Gentiles coming to know the Lord through Jesus without a physical building. After all, the church is the temple of God, right? Because God dwells in us. Uh, so that was his application of this passage. It has nothing to do with the literal fulfillment at all. So based on that, I mean, it seems like literal fulfillments are not the big deal that we should, that we, we now I think they would be. Um, Non-literal fulfillments are very much in bounds. I mean, you can propose those. And in James's case, this was correct, a correct reading of the book of Amos. So there's the first piece of advice. Don't be too concerned about finding literal fulfillments. You know, look for the non-literal ones too. My second piece of advice is to consider realized fulfillments. When I say realized fulfillments, I mean reading these prophecies as though they have been fulfilled. 
Again, a lot of Christians have it in their head, and you'll even hear Christians say this, most of Old Testament prophecy has not been fulfilled. That's not how the New Testament reads Old Testament prophecy. They very much read it as a record of realized fulfillments. Um, and I want to show you an example of that uh, using a passage that I've actually already read. At the beginning, I read you all of Isaiah chapter 60. Let's read verse 3 out of that again. And just let's, let's play with this idea here. Isaiah 60 verse 3 says this, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And you know, this in the context of, you know, a description of what, you know, should be a description of Israel's future glory when they're the head and not the tail and the most powerful nation in the world. But how does Jesus talk about that idea? Well, there should be a passage coming to your mind and your center reference column probably agrees with me. Let's read Matthew chapter 5 verses, uh, let's see, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Okay, so Jesus makes it sound like we can be that fulfillment now. We can be that light to the nations now. We don't have to wait uh, for some future time. In other words, Jesus treats that bit, that idea from Isaiah as something that has been realized in his kingdom. It's a realized fulfillment, not something that's coming in the future. So again, as you read Old Testament prophecies, give heed to the possibility that, that these are realized fulfillments, that we're dealing with prophecies that have been fulfilled. Now, my third and final piece of advice is that you consider spiritual fulfillments. By this, I mean that some prophecies will have a fulfillment pertaining to spiritual realities rather than events. I think very often when we, when we think about fulfilled prophecies, we're thinking about finding some event that fulfills the prophecy. But sometimes it's ideas that fulfill these prophecies. They're spiritual ideas. Now, to give you an example, again, from the mouth of Jesus himself, let's read John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, what's truly interesting about this passage is there is no Old Testament passage that says, you know, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So we can't go to a particular text. That said, the Old Testament prophets have a lot to say about that kind of thing. You know, Isaiah has his streams in the desert idea. Ezekiel has that picture in chapters 40 through 48 of his book of that great big temple city, uh, that is Jerusalem in the future, with that river flowing out from it, uh, giving life to the surrounding countryside. So those ideas are there. But here's the thing, Jesus isn't applying that to an actual river. Um, you know, you might say from, you know, reading the Old Testament prophets, well, the whole geography of the land of Israel will change because that giant river of life will be flowing out and will transform the countryside. But that's not it. Let's not forget again that we are the temple of God. We are the tabernacle of David. From us flows the rivers of living water, because as Jesus said, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in us and through us and gives life to the world through the preaching of the gospel. That's how Jesus handles that whole idea of rivers of living water. It's not about, you know, an actual event where this river starts gushing forth. No, it's a spiritual idea. It's the Holy Spirit giving life through the gospel. So again, that's a spiritual fulfillment. All that to say, based on how New Testament authors interpret prophecy, we should be willing to consider non-literal, realized, spiritual fulfillments of Old Testament prophecy. So based on these considerations, and this is my final heading for today, a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom has no place in the end times. I say this because we have no compelling evidence to support such a powerful Jewish kingdom in our future. 
Many like to argue this point from Old Testament prophecy, as I have mentioned already. They like to say, well, the, these prophecies have to be fulfilled at some time, and the only place to do that is a millennial kingdom coming in the future. But based on the New Testament and how they handle these things, we have every reason to believe that Old Testament prophecy has been fulfilled in a non-literal, spiritual fashion through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which doesn't really leave a place to apply these things to some future coming kingdom of Israel. Uh, the next event in the prophetic timeline, therefore, is you know the return of Christ, at which time we'll see all those other things, you know, the general resurrection, the judgment of the nations, the new heavens and the new earth, the fullness of the kingdom. We don't need this space of time, we don't need a future millennium to make room for an earthly kingdom for Israel. We don't need that because we have no reason to believe that that's how Old Testament prophecy is meant to be interpreted. There's this whole other way of interpreting it that has a lot more justification from how the New Testament authors interpret those things. However, I don't want any of you to be tempted to go to the opposite extreme with this, because that is a problem. There are a lot of Christians throughout history who seem to have it in their head that this kind of means anything goes. You know, find some passage of the Old Testament, you know, be it prophecy or otherwise, find an idea that kind of fits with it and just force that onto it. And that's the way that they, they read the Old Testament. No, you can't do that. Um, these things have to come from the passage. Now, for those of you who have listened extensively to my Matthew study, you know that I very often spent a lot of time talking about whenever Matthew quotes the Old Testament or, and somehow interprets it or applies it to Jesus, I always spent a lot of time trying to figure out how he, how he came to his conclusions. Why did he say what he said? I did that because I wanted you to see the method. There is a method to that. It's not just, you know, Matthew saying, well, the Old Testament says this, and I'm just going to put Jesus on that. No, that's not how it works. Very, very often, and I've seen this in other New Testament authors as well, it seems to me like they try to find, that when they're reading the Old Testament, they find some detail that maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a literal fulfillment. And they start to ask themselves, okay, well, how, how does this com come true, actually? How do we actually understand this? And then they build their interpretation outward from there. It seems to me far more often that that is what they are doing. So when you want to interpret the Old Testament in the kinds of ways I'm talking about today, you have to do the work. You have to be a diligent student of Old Testament prophecy. You've got to read those things. Pay attention to those details and ask yourself, do these details make sense? Very often you're going to find things that are kind of weird. Well, there's usually meaning in that weirdness. There's usually ways that you can interpret those things that maybe don't work with a, you know, a literal fulfillment of some event, but work very well with the kind of spiritual, non-literal interpretation that I'm talking about in this whole series. So yes, do these kinds of things. Be actively thinking this way as you read the Old Testament, but you have to do the work. You can't just put Christian ideas on an Old Testament passage. Those ideas have to come from the Old Testament prophecy, even if it's in a way that, again, is like trying to decode a riddle. Like, ooh, why is this detail here? Why did he say it that way? What's the hidden meaning in there? Like, that kind of thing is what you need to be doing. Uh, now, despite that word of warning, though, I stand by this. This can open up your view, uh, open up your ability to understand the Old Testament in all new ways. I mean, it can give you this whole part of your Bible. You know, stop using the Old Testament to, to count numbers and determine codes and make your charts for the end times. Start reading it as a rich exposition of the coming kingdom of God which to us is now the present kingdom of God. Start reading it that way to find it as a rich description of what realities are currently true through the gospel in Christ. So all that to say, um, let's do a summary. That's pretty much all I have to say tonight. Uh, just again, we're not talking about an earthly kingdom for Israel. We don't need that. Uh, that is not where the New Testament goes in its reading of prophecy. We're talking about a heavenly kingdom for Christ. Uh, so again, uh, some Christians certainly believe that Old Testament prophecy points to these Jewish hopes of a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom, but I argue that the Old Testament undermines that by portraying prophecy as something that is very deliberately unclear, something that conceals truth 
and something that would remain locked until the end time. Uh, and then I demonstrated that the New Testament teaches that the mystery of the gospel is actually what unlocks prophecy and allows us to understand it in ways that no one could before Jesus actually came. And I exhorted you to interpret Old Testament prophecy accordingly based on New Testament examples, looking for non-literal fulfillments that are realized fulfillments and also spiritual fulfillments. And then finally, just all that to say, that a supremely powerful Jewish kingdom has no place in the end times, and therefore we don't need a millennial kingdom. And what I was saying about the millennium is probably correct uh, in earlier sermons. So where are we going next time? Well, I have a couple sermons planned on the 70 weeks of Daniel. So be looking forward to that, and hopefully you'll keep watching and be helped by these things. Thank you.